Hey, welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. Um, of course, your host, Thad Forrester, and this is episode number 52. Today, my guest is Matt Larson, and I want to tell you how this came about. One of my listeners, John Valentine, contacted me several weeks ago and said, Hey, I can get you Matt Larson if you'd be interested in having him. And I said, of course. So thank you, John, for making that happen and for listening to the podcast. I really appreciate your support. And John is headed to the Air Force uh, Combat Control Pipeline soon to NDOC. So wish you the best, John. I hope you dominate there and enjoy your time in the Air Force Special Ops community. So let's get into Matt. He's known as the father of modern Army combatives. You can read all about him in the show notes. I'm not going to waste any more of your time, but had a great, great talk with Matt. What we were talking about a second ago before we went live was people's reactions to violence or the possibility of violence. What have you found in your dealings with military and non-mil? Well, I found actually the same thing. So, you know, in the um, in the military, there, there are two major obstacles to getting realistic training throughout the force. And the, and the first one is that there's 10,000 sources of bad information. And <laughs> what I mean by that is people don't always know even what they think they know as far as, as it relates to training organizations within the force. I guess we can talk about that later. But the, but the other one is that we don't necessarily have the warrior ethos that we, we'd like to think we have. And so a lot of people are, are uncomfortable with the, with the concept of, uh, inter, of being comfortable with interpersonal violence. And that, that's a major challenge. You know, it's a challenge from the perspective of getting people into the training. It's a challenge from getting it through um, commanders who have to buy off on the training. And it, it's a real obstacle. And I'm, I'm sure it's probably not an obstacle that's going to go away until we've, we've changed the culture enough to value the warrior ethos where those people just get booked in because they can't help it. Um, and on the civilian side, it's the same way. There's a, there is a large amount of training that goes on out there that sort of masquerades as real training, but they have taken all the scary things out of it. So it's a, that's kind of a big topic as well, but, but getting the, getting the realistic, hard, scary training, the concept of being, of being comfortable with interpersonal violence. And that's a, that's quite a challenge. But why is so that? Imagine, imagine, well, imagine that boxing is a game, right? Men play the game of boxing where they go in and hit each other in the head. So that concept doesn't resonate with a lot of people, but it's a game. We play it for fun. Yeah. And there's and rules. And if somebody gets hurt, it, everything stops. Yeah. And, and but even, even that it's a violent game, you know, there's, we're going in there and somebody might get a broken nose, but that doesn't make it less fun to the people who are warriors. It makes it more fun. You know, there's, there's that element of danger and element, and especially when it's, you know, mano a mano and it's, it's intimate and it's intense. You know, I can see why maybe some type of civilian courses might be watered down, but why even in the military is it where people don't want to face the facts of, of, potential violence well imagine this you know imagine you know when you went to high school and you were and there was a there was a football team at the high school right imagine what the, that coach demanded of those players and how intensely they worked out you know every every high school kid in america does two a days and they and it's harsh you know it's it's tough and the coach doesn't really care if you're a quitter they just let you quit well imagine that if you tried to train an infantry platoon in the in the u.s military if you try to train a unit that hard, unless it was some elite, you know, volunteer unit, you would be in trouble because there's, because there's just not, because there's just not really that warrior ethos that we'd like to think we have. And so I used to always joke about, I was stationed in Okinawa and I was a young Marine and I, I was, uh, Okinawa is where all the karate in the world comes from. This is back in the eighties. So I was training karate and I was in a Marine infantry battalion, third battalion, fifth Marines. So guess how many people of the 800 or so that were in that battalion were motivated and out training martial arts on their own? Very few. Cause that number, yeah, that number was one. <laughs> and so, few, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so the amount of people who are self motivated to train hard, especially when it comes to fighting and something where you might get humiliated or you might get, you know, what are the consequences if you, if you, uh, go out running or something. The consequences are you fall back and you get humiliated a little bit because you're not as fast as everybody else. What, what happens if you're training kickboxing or something and, and, uh, or, you know, realistic combatives or something and you, 
and you're not that good at it, well, you get beat up and humiliated. <laughs> so that is a large, you know, human beings are more motivated in certain, in certain circumstances to avoid public humiliation than they are to avoid death. So it's a, important to understand that about people. We have to we have to do the groundwork to get them motivated to to get the training to become to start happening. Has it gotten worse with time? Like, is it a generational thing, or just has it pretty much always been the same? I think it's always the same. I mean, th- there are other aspects that have clearly gotten worse as we've become more and more civilized. Imagine the World War II generation; they all, you know, many of them grew up on farms and they had to kill the animals they ate. So there's a certain level of of exposure to the harshness of the world that is lacking in, in a modern world. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think that, you know, we, we've got, you know, people right now all over the world fighting and, and every generation of old people think the young people are not as hard as they were. Well, I just think that's probably nonsense. Cause I've seen an awful lot of really, really tough young, you know, soldiers in this, in this current generation. So I wouldn't say it's getting worse over time. I think that, in fact, I would say it's better. Imagine the army that I grew up in, the Marine Corps that I grew up in. There was no, there was no hand-to-hand combat training. It was worth mentioning it. You know, we had the we had the the legacy from the old Sykes Fairbairn systems from World War II, and you know all, all the other equivalencies from that time frame. And what did they leave us with throughout the, you know, 70s and 80s? I came in in 1984. So, what were we left with at that time? Well, there was a doctrine that said we would do hand-to-hand. And it even had a list of techniques in the book that you should do. But nobody actually did it. I mean, literally no one. So there's not a single person. There is not a single person in the world ever who can say prior to, you know, 1990s that they actually learned how to fight from the doctrine within the military, you know, over the last reasonable amount of historical time. Nobody in the in the Vietnam era, nobody in the 70s, nobody in the 80s was learning how to fight because of what the doctrine was. So that has certainly changed. We are training lots and lots of people who are very good fighters now. Is that in, in, in the big army or are you talking about specific, uh, you know, SF or other groups? Well, I would say that I, I can speak to that as, as an army as a whole. And I would say that it is true within certain areas of the special operations community, but I wouldn't want to paint that in too broad of a brush because, you know, there are areas of the special operations community that don't have very good programs at all. And there are are areas of the special ops world where you can still avoid learning how to fight and be respected. And, And that that's the actual cultural challenge. You know, how do you create a culture where you must be a good fighter in order to be respected as a member of a unit? So, so in the regular army, there are, there are, you know, some of the best programs in the world are in regular army units. And there are some very, very good, you know, programs in some of the special operations units. But there's some others that are not so good. Um, and, you know, I can, if you're, if you're interested, I can kind of tell you why that is and what it is about the various programs that creates that dynamic. Yeah, but let's do that. If, Okay, well, you know, you're, if you're, if I said, what's your measure of success in a combatives program? Well, I would say, you know, the, the easy answer is the the measurable ability of the average members of the unit. In other words, if I grab somebody at random out of the unit and put them in a fighting situation, can they handle themselves? Do they have skills because of the program? So I would. That that is a very high standard, and it also has nothing to do with who the best guy in the unit is. Or, you know, you could have a unit that that has eight UFC champions in it, and yet the unit is entirely untrained because nobody else is training except for those eight guys. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Of that is a on the big army side. Once upon a time, I I uh, hired a guy that was to train one of the army's divisions. So which division will be remain nameless and the guy will too, but let's just say he was a really squared away guy. He was, was a, you know, high level black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He had um, a master's degree in physical education. He was, you know, a very good instructor. There was lots of good things about him, right? So I brought him out to the division, 
put a gym underneath him and said, you know, showed him what the curriculum was and said, okay, uh, you know, here's what your mission is. Go train the guys in this division on this. So I came back six or eight months later and I walked into the gym and he had like a hundred people in there training. I was like, wow, this is fantastic, you know? And so he, he, uh, showed me around all that they knew and all that kind of, I'm like, this is great. Okay. Let's go inspect the division. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you've got 20,000 men in this division. And so your mission is to train 20,000 people and make them better. Uh, so let's go check. So we got in the truck and drove around. We spent three days driving around, pulling random soldiers, you know, out of units and off the street and whatnot, and asking them to demonstrate anything they might know from the program. And we didn't find a single one out of maybe a hundred that we pulled aside that knew anything about fighting as far as what they learned from the program. And so I told him, okay, so you've got a hundred trained people here and you've got 20,000 to train. So, so that's, you know, what percentage of 1% that <laughs> of success and, and you got 19,900 people who are untrained, right? So ultimate failure. So, so why does that happen? Well, because that's the expertise of martial arts instructors. Imagine this, every, every martial art that there is, every martial artist teacher out there in the civilian world, they have they, their expertise is to train self-motivated people, right? Like I have a commercial school. Who do I train in that school? People who come in off the street and, and people that we go out and find and fire them up to come in, right? And so every one of those people have in common that they're there because they want to be. So that's the easiest thing in the world to tr teach somebody a skill when they're self-motivated to do it. But that's not, the, that's not what's needed when you want to train an organization, because there's, there's not organizations where everybody's self-motivated. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that def definitively, as in, as in I have trained with and to the very best units in the world. Anyone that you've, you might be having in your head while I'm saying that, that some classified mission unit or something, I've trained those guys, and there's not a single one of those units where everybody is self-motivated to become an expert hand-to-hand -hand fighter. So that's the task. How do you train a unit full of people who are not necessarily self-motivated? Okay, so that's not an expertise that martial arts instructors have, by and large. Mm -hmm. And it's the expertise you need. So that's one of the reasons. So almost all the, you know, the special mission units and whatnot, what they almost all do is hire somebody who's a local martial arts teacher who puts together a curriculum of techniques that they think they might need to learn. They put it in a small amount of training, you know, several days worth or whatnot. They run everybody through the training, check the block, and now everybody's trained, right? <laughs> well, no, because if there's not ongoing training, everybody who's a real martial artist knows if you're not getting in there two or three days of the week and training, well, then you're not getting better. Yep. Imagine oh, yeah. if I, imagine if, imagine if I was going to go up against, you know, like a, you know, whatever sport you pick it, it doesn't matter what the physical skill set is, you, whatever sport. And I said, okay, I'm going to run these guys through five days of training and then no more training until six months later when we're going to have the game. How would they do? Mm -hmm. Well, they would suck, right? So, so we know that. And interestingly, we know, you know, I, my current job is I work at the department of physical education at the United States military Academy at West point, right? I'm the director of combatives there. And so what basically what that means is I work in a building full of guys who are PhDs in physical fitness, right? Like literally 40 people. Yeah. So with that being said, we absolutely know the, the psychomotor learning process, what it takes to learn a physical skill. doesn't matter what the physical skill is, right? We know what the process is because the experimentation has been done and we got a body of science behind that that's, empirical right so with that being said the training that goes on in almost all of the training plans that are being used out around the force and around the country and whatnot do not follow that science so naturally enough they're not effective do you train uh, you know real time real speed or or slow motion or what's your training like what i train like is it is all of the above so let me give you a, a perfect analogy how do you train a basketball team? What do you what do you do? Okay, so let's just so imagine we have a bunch of people who didn't know anything about basketball, and we wanted to teach them to be a good basketball team, go out there and win games. How would we do it? 
Well, we all know what we'd do. First, we'd teach the sort of individual skills, right? We'd start off with dribbling in place, and then we'd dribble while we were walking, and pretty soon we would be dribbling while we were running. We'd start with passing, all those individual skills, right? And that would take some time before we got it. And then we'd start doing a whole bunch of other drills that taught them how to work together, you know, passing on the run, et cetera, et cetera. And as we did all that, pretty soon we'd work our way up to scrimmage. And then after we'd, because you can't learn how to head fake somebody unless you're trying to actually head fake somebody, right? Yeah. And you can't learn to read a head fake unless somebody's actually trying to do it to you, right? So we would do that process and pretty soon we'd have a ball team that could play. So that's the process. It doesn't matter what skill set we're talking about. The same psychomotor learning process is going to happen. You know, I'm going to show somebody a technique, right? And I'm going to say, okay, so what? here's the technique, and I've demonstrated it to them and whatnot. So that's the portion where we're going, okay, our brain has learned it. It's cognitive, right? But our body hasn't learned it yet. So what happens then is our brain tells our body to do it. And it doesn't have a perfect understanding of it, so it doesn't come out very good. But we do it again and again and again. And what's going on neurologically is that our brain is making all those connections, so those movements are becoming easier and easier and more refined. And as we've done it enough times, we get to the point where it starts to become automatic. We don't have to think about it. So, for example, if I'm a hockey player, right, and I'm skating down the ice, handling the puck, there's a play going on, what am I thinking about? Well, it isn't skating, and it isn't handling the puck. (laughs) I'm thinking about the tactical situation, right? Mm -hmm. And how did I get to that level? The only way you can get to that level is to skate a lot, handle the puck a lot. That's it, right? Yeah, yeah. There's no like short. There's no like shortcut. There's no magic bean. You know, like a, I'm going to come on and give you a two hour seminar on hockey, and all of a sudden you're going to be good at it. You, you talked about <laughs> some people. Some are motivated to learn, and some are not. Are some of those people that are motivated? Is it because they have been through a violent encounter or some type of situations? Like, hey, now I better. I, I, I've discovered a weakness. I got to do something about it. Yeah, I, I mean, there are. The answer to that would be. You know, yes, there are some people who are self-motivated because they have realized that they must be. But it goes deeper than that. You know, some people's father play rough and tumble sports with them, and therefore they learn to like that kind of thing, and some people's don't. You know, so you get to be a grown-up person, and you've never really had somebody playing rough with you, and all of a sudden here's the roughest thing there is. You know, like it? <laughs> well, <laughs> some people don't. Yeah. So... So it's it's possible to instill and culturate that in them, you know, that you have to take the perspective of how we're gonna how we're gonna create a culture that demands that of everybody, and then they will, you know, jump in. I mean, you know, the, what's the the most motivating things? Most motivating thing to all of us is fitting in with the culture that we want to be part of. So so that's real real training is how do you create that culture that demands that of people. And then they will. They'll they'll jump in. All right. So I wanted to go back just a little bit about your background. I mean, you. What was it about martial arts that interested you? And you got involved in I don't know globally. You know, yeah. You talked about I think shoot uh, Japan, Thailand, Philippines, Korea. I mean, what was it about that that you made you love it so well, much? Well, well, my first duty station as a young Marine was Marine Barracks, Tokyo. And when I was going there, I'd never done any martial arts. I never wrestled. You know, I was I played high school football and baseball, and I was on the rodeo team, right? So, so that's pretty rough and tumble sports, football and rodeo. You know, so I already kind of had a taste for those sort of things. And and I would, you know, to be honest, also the image that that the being a part of those things give you gives you of yourself. You know, what kind of person do you want to be? Well, clearly, I wanted to be a tough person, so I was putting myself in those positions, right? So I went to first duty station Tokyo. I figured if I was there two years and didn't train the martial arts, I would have wasted my chance. So I started training. I started training judo and karate first, which is really kind of funny in the long run. Um, the judo cost nothing. And so I, so I, I did, I dabbled in it and the karate cost money. So I did that almost religiously, uh, which is really funny because you now 30 years later, my judo is still not that good. And, you know, <laughs> I've, I've pretty much abandoned everything I ever did in karate. So but not everything. That's not a fair thing to say, but mostly, um, but then, you know, my, my, my life in the martial arts was 
was actually sort of, um, you know, like a series of hard lessons because I was moving around, going to different places. And I'll give you an example. So I'd been a karate guy for a while and I'm, um, we went to my unit, went to Korea. And so while I was in Korea, they, we had this big field meet with the Korean Marines and by field meet, I mean, we played like soccer and, you know, kick volleyball and tug of war and all this stuff. And, and they beat us at almost everything except tug of war, you know, naturally. So after it was all over, they brought out, um, their Taekwondo champions and they were showing off. Well, my, my guys, you know, I was the karate guy. So my guys went, woke me up and, so I got in sort of a ring of people and fought the Korean Marine Corps or Taekwondo champion in a bare knuckle fight, right? So I beat the guy down because I just punched him in the head a bunch. But the bad news was that everybody in my battalion had seen me beat this guy, right? So we had a boxing smoker about a month later. And so my commander was like, yeah, put Larson in there. You know, he's tough. Of course, I had never boxed. So they, but everybody had seen me <laughs> fight this other guy so they put me in with a guy who was like a real boxer you know and uh, he didn't just beat me he humiliated me you know, like, in front of everybody just beat the tar out of me knocked me down twice in each round and then knocked me out in the third and worse after he knocked me down twice he would put his hands down and just be elusive so i couldn't hit it you know, just made me, I mean, li- literally humiliated me so i was like okay i guess i better learn to box you know so so through a series of similar incidents over time, <laughs> I f- slowly started rounding out my martial arts, you know, repertoire so that I had skills across the board. And then, and then of course, in the early nineties, when the, when the UFC came along and, you know, Hoist Gracie was tearing everybody up, I got into jujitsu right away. Cause I saw that, you know, I started doing jujitsu in 94, maybe, maybe 95, something like that really pretty early. I, it, but I had already had a, quite an experience in boxing, kickboxing, movies. I had already fight, fought in Thailand and Japan and Korea and the Philippines and all those places before then. So so it wasn't like a neophyte coming into it. I already had um, some skills. And so I, I kind of knew right away, you know, here's here's what's great about this, but here's what's not so great about it. You know, I could see, for example, the way the jiu-jitsu world used to teach how to achieve the clinch. And, close the gap on people you know in, 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 in muay thai they have a saying that if you want to clinch really bad that's just how you'll get it you know it's just like a tattoo right? you want a tattoo really bad you're going to get a really bad tattoo right so <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly what happens if you go reaching for a guy in a tie fight he's going to crush you because as soon as your arms extend you got no defense right so so i saw that kind of thing going on in the jiu-jitsu world and, and by also, the way, clinch, the cl- clinch is close range or the distance between you. What exactly is that? So clinch meaning, uh, you know, imagine the portion of wrestling where we're where we're holding each other's upper torso. We're standing, but I've got like my arms wrapped around you and you have yours half wrapped around me. So we're all kind of wrapped up with each other, standing grappling. OK, so that that's a very common uh, range if you watch mixed martial arts fighting or, or, you know, Greco-Roman wrestling or Muay Thai or, you know, a lot of those kind of sports. And, and in, in truth, it's in real fighting, it's kind of the range of decision. Um, you know, we can come back on that in a second, but that's kind of who decides what range the fight is going to happen at is the one who's dominant there. Okay. You know, so I'll give you an example of that. So imagine in, you know, 2002, 2003 when the war started in Iraq and Afghanistan the doctrine for close quarters battle at the time was that if your long gun your main weapon malfunctioned there were two actual two versions of the doctrine if you if you were the kind of person in the army that didn't have a sidearm like a regular infantryman or something the doctrine was that if your weapon malfunctioned when you were going to your point of domination in a room that you would take a knee so that you would clear the line of sight for your buddies to, to shoot the person if they were in front of you. And if you were in the sort of the part of the army that didn't, that had um, sidearms that you would transition to your sidearm. So the, the problem with that became immediately apparent when the wars kicked off and we were actually clearing buildings with bad guys is that 
the average room in Iraq or Afghanistan isn't very big. So imagine it's probably eight feet from the doorway to the deepest recession in the room, you know? So that means when you come through the door, if you have some sort of malfunction, that, then you are, um, you're literally three feet from your bad guy when it happens. Just think how quickly you can cover eight feet walking through the door. So if you have a malfunction, you're going to be on him. If you take a knee, you're going to be a kneeling at his feet. Yeah. If you try to transition to your sidearm, you're already going to be touching each other. So what really happens is when that weapon malfunctions, you just drive forward, smash him into the wall. And now you've got to dominate whose arms are where because there's still weapons in the fight, right? Even if, even if you can't get your long gun to bear because it's too long for the clinch situation you're in, because that's what happens. You know, you've got your weapon in between you. It's on an assault sling or something. You smash into the guy. Your weapon's pointing off in some crazy direction. And it's just malfunctioned anyway. So it's just kind of in the way in there, right? But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a gun. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a sidearm. And you might have a sidearm. So what's really going on in the fight is you're, you're d fighting at that standing clinch range to see who's going to gain control of the weapons. Because whoever does is going to win the fight. And so I like to say, you know, we, we, we train a lot without any weapons because that's the fundamental. Because what weapons are is they're tools, right? They just mm -hmm. make your job easier. So that doesn't change the dynamics of leverage or anything, which you learn the fundamentals of that without the weapon. But real fighting on the battlefield is about who's going to control the weapons. It's not unarmed fighting. It's fighting for control of the weapons. And so, so that's, you know, that's kind of that's what it's really all about. And that, and that it mostly happens at that range we were just talking about. It happens there or it happens on the ground um, and it happens on the ground, you know, because in those rooms, there's also furniture and there's debris on the floor and you might fall over or whatnot. That happens a lot. So I always like oh. to tell a story, my, my high speed uh, combat takedown story, right? <laughs> so I've been, been training, you know, judo and wrestling and various takedown arts for years and years so once upon a time i went through the door and there's a bad guy like two feet to my left and that shit is terrifying so so what i did was i put my hand in the guy's face and i'm pretty sure i started yelling and i started shoving him and i shoved him over this piece of furniture and then fell on top of him so there, there's your 15 or 20 years of judo and wrestling in combat with body armor shoving the guy over the couch right <laughs> so so what happened way. after that uh, then I landed on top of the guy, and we were fighting after that. So, it came out. It, it was just saying it, it came out my way. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting background because I know you rewrote the Army's combative field manual, like in like in '02, and updated it later. I mean, anything else that happened, or that, or why did you rewrite it? Was part of that because of the whole, yeah, kneeling thing? If you're if you're in a post situation, yeah. And, so so the, so the story on that is bit of a long story. So in 1995, I was in the second range of battalion and, and our commander was general Stan McChrystal. You might remember him because oh, yeah. he was at one point. Yeah. So he was in charge of the special ops war later on as a four star charge of the war in Afghanistan as well. So, so with that being said, he ordered us to start doing hand to hand combat training. So, uh, we started doing what the, yeah, 95. So he, we started doing what the manual said to do, which was the old legacy, you know, there's a, you can look up the, the, the field manual, FM 21-150 from, from 1992, I think. And you can see what's in there. I mean, it's hitting people with a, with a shovel and, which is still a good technique, by the way, but <laughs> other stuff, you know, like, uh, sort of, uh, traditional martial artsy sort of stuff that was popular in America at that, at that era. And imagine what, remember what we knew about martial arts in those days was it seems almost silly looking back at it, you know, so the 95, when we started doing that stuff, we went back to the commander and general, you know, Stan, general McChrystal and said, Hey, sir, this is silly. It's kind of a waste of time. We, we'd rather be shooting or fighting or I'm sorry, shooting or rucking or, doing regular physical training or something that we knew there's going to be a training value out of. And he came back to us and said, well, 
the, the idea of hand to hand combat training is not silly. So it must be the method. And he challenged us to figure out a better way. And I, I was lucky enough, you know, I had that, I had already, you know, 11 years or so of martial arts training at that point. I was already doing jujitsu. I'd been doing judo for years and, and karate and Muay Thai and all that stuff. So, so I was training my guys the way I knew how to fight. And, um, I had, I was a squad leader. I had only, you know, eight guys work for me. So I, I was training my eight guys and pretty soon they were whipping all the guys in the platoon. So pretty soon I was training the platoon. So that's about 30 guys or so. And then those 30 started whipping all the guys in the company. So that's about 150. So started training all those guys. And pretty soon I became the battalion master trainer just because my methods were, were effective. And, you know, it, it's interesting too, at the time when it started with, with uh, the first group of people that, that, um, you know, came to the fore because there was a lot of them were people doing ninjutsu, which is really funny. Cause the only way we would have been doing ninjutsu for two years and then it would have died off when the Colonel left if we hadn't been able to whip all those guys. So, so and really kind of on the strength of that, you know, that's what kind of grew around the army. So first, second range of battalion, well, from that one squad of eight guys to the second range of battalion, all training. And then I came down to be the regimental command, the regimental hand to hand combat guy for the whole 75th range regiment. And that was at Fort Benning. And then after that, I went over to the ranger training brigade. Um, the leaders in the ranger regiment have to cycle back out to the regular army before they can um, take the next ring. So imagine if before you can command a company in the Rangers, you must first command a, a rifle company in the regular army. So you would be a commander in the 82nd airborne and the 101st or something like that to be even eligible to get a command in the Rangers. So the same thing happens with battalion commanders and brigade commanders. And when a guy leaves battalion command as a range of battalion commander, there's a pretty good thing, pretty good chance he's going to get a brigade in the regular army. So that's what happened. They all went out in the regular army then they said, yeah, we should change what the army is doing to uh, what we were doing in the Rangers. And so I went over to the Ranger training brigade, which is Ranger school. If you're familiar with the difference between those two things. Uh, and that's who held the doctrine. So I was over there to write the manual. And then as it spread around the army, commanders started asking us to come train their guys. And that's how we slowly built up the, what became eventually the army combative school and all the various levels and, you know, the curriculum and all that stuff all, all grew out of that process. Okay. And it all kind of grew in the grassroots mode from the, from the ground up, from one squad into the whole army, just based upon success. What were some changes from 02 to 09, you know, when it was, up, and was 09 the last time it was updated? Uh, well, it's, it's a training circular now and it gets updated sort of fairly re fairly often now. Um, what happened between 02 and 09 was we went to war and we had quite a bit of experience. And 09 was at the end of the surge. And so we went from the buildup and the kinetic warfare charging across Iraq and, you know, then the surge and all that stuff, all that stuff went on. And during that time we were doing post-action interviews with guys who got in fights. So we had hundreds of people that we talked to who were in real fights in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, And so we learned the differences between what we thought would happen and what really happens. And, you know, I'll give you an example. So when, when we first were, you know, going up there in kinetic warfare, charging across Iraq, we figured the way fights would happen was, remember what I said earlier about the doctor and being taken knee or draw your sidearm. Mm -hmm. We figured what would happen really would just be you'd slam into the guy and then start dominating him. Right. So if you if you imagine that in the context of what happens in like mixed martial arts, that was almost exactly what Hoyce Gracie did in those early UFCs, right? He beat all those guys because he even had a better strategy, and that was to close the gap with them, achieve a dominant position on them, then finish the fight. So that, you know, we can call that the sort of jujitsu plan. That plan was what we went into the war with that as our doctrine, but the nature of hand to hand changed as it became an insurgency and whatnot. So the way ha fights would happen later, a part of the war, imagine you go through the door and now there's like an old man standing there with his hands up and behind him is a curtain. And you don't have any idea what's behind that curtain. It's either a bomb factory or it's his, you know, 
wife and daughter back there without their clothes on trying to change. And so, so now he's across the room from you. What do you do? You know, if you, if, even if this guy starts fighting you, so imagine I, I decided I need to go clear what's in there. Cause it might be a bomb factory. As I'm going over there, the guy grabs me or grabs my rifle or something. Well, there's not a rule. There's not an ROE, you know, rules of engagement. There's not an ROE in the world that would not allow me to shoot the guy. But if I shoot the guy, maybe the whole town knows, yo, you just shot old man Jones. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He just didn't want you to see his naked daughter. And you've just lost that veil. Everybody there knows you're the bad guy because you're murderers. So that's how fights really happen. You know, or at least, at least an appreciable amount of them happen. So that puts a pretty high standard on what we must know. And so that's what changed. You know, the tactics changed because they were, they grew out of that basic sort of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tactic into what the battlefield demanded um, for success, you know? And then, and you know, of course, there's a thousand different scenarios like that. Imagine people drive up to you or a roadblock that you're manning on the road or a, or a, a gate to get onto your base or something. And there's a language barrier and you can't make them do what you want them to do. What are you going to do? Are you going to shoot them? Because that's what the, the, you know, that's what the, I would just shoot you crew that doesn't want to train combatants. That's what they've got, right? You shoot them, but you can't, or is you a murderer? So you end up having to manhandle them. Well, if you don't know how to manhandle people, if you're not trained in combatives, and you don't have tactics that have evolved for that for those real scenarios, well, you're going to end up. It ain't going to go your way. <laughs> the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what happened. You know, we we just learned a lot because we were fighting the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, both, and we were having constant feedback from people that were on the battlefield, really fighting bad guys. I imagine that's how you're staying up to date now, right? You have to constantly get feedback from the ground, or are you, I mean, are you ever, maybe you're still doing some deployments across the world? Well, I, I deployed a bunch as a contractor after I, you know, intermittently through these years, but mostly what I've done in the in the last um, several years is, is, is teach organizations how to do it. Imagine that we've had we've had combatives doctrine and combatives programs forever. You know, the, the first the first combatives field manual was was a translation from a French bayonet field fighting manual in in 1852 by Captain George McClellan. That's how long we've had hand to hand combat doctrine. But in all that time, nobody really learned from the doctrine how to fight until recently, right? Until the until our program starting in the 90s. So with, with that being said, um, you know, that it all, what that tells you is how to do it is not intuitive. And in fact, all the things that seem like the way you would do it, they're the wrong answers and they have predictable negative results. I'll give an example too. So almost every combatant's program, the way they work is, or the way they, they start is a commander, you know, in my case was General McChrystal, but it, it'll be a commander who, who may or may not know anything about hand-to-hand combat training, right? It doesn't matter if he does. In fact, probably if he does, it's the wrong knowledge because he learned it from some civilian martial arts teacher. So so they they decide they uh, want to have combatives training. So the next thing they do is they look at their training calendar and they see how much time they can dedicate to the training. And I would say that it doesn't even matter. If they have two hours or 20 hours or, or 200, it doesn't make any difference. And you'll see why in a minute. Because the second thing they do is they go hire some expert or find some expert, either within the unit or outside of it, some local civilian or something, to teach the guys. And this person is the one I described earlier. It might be, you know, the holder of the red sash and five animal kung fu, and it might be the latest UFC champion. It doesn't make any difference. Because what that person does is look at the tactical situation that he thinks the members of this organization are going to find themselves in, and then he comes up with a set of techniques to address it. So we know that what's going to happen. You know, that, I mean, that seems to totally make sense, right? That, 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 that way that plays out, it makes complete sense. It's totally common sense. But we know it's going to fail. So imagine this. If I came to the, the, the company that you work at, and I said, I'm going to take all the females who work in this company out. I'm going to give them two Saturdays in a row or four Saturdays in a row, a class on the techniques of rape prevention. 
So what we've done is we've we've got a we've selected our our unit population, some of which may be motivated, but most of which will probably not not self motivated. And we've said how much time on the training calendar we've got: two Saturdays, maybe eight hours each, so sixteen hours of training. And well, we're going to go give them the techniques that fit their tactical situation, which is preventing rape, right? So we, we know exactly what the results of that training will be, don't we? Everybody listening knows. They're going to come in and train. It's going to be fun. They're going to half-ass learn the techniques. Whenever it's over, they're never going to do it again. And six months or six years later, when they find themselves in that position, it'll be as if the training never happened. Oh, yeah. And that is exact. That is exactly the results of almost every combative training plan. Okay, because if you're if you, and, and you can tell if somebody's going to fail, because if you ask them what what should happen in the combatants program, what they're going to do, they'll give you a technical answer. These are the techniques I like. I mean, I laugh at the critiques of what I teach because they're always the critique of the techniques, but the techniques don't matter. They don't matter at all. It's not important, and even a little bit, what techniques we pick. Because what matters is whether or not the people learn how to train and continue to train. So my entire curriculum is based around teaching people how to train and motivating them to continue training, showing them how to continue training, showing them how to fit the training into the culture of their existing organization such that they will be able to continue doing it. Because that's the only way that they will ever have the skills they need when they need them. How often are troops in hand-to-hand -hand combat situations these days? Well, imagine this. When was the last time a bunch of U.S. soldiers cleared a building where they could shoot everybody in it? Probably 2003. And we, we send soldiers because we can't kill everybody in the building. If we could kill everybody in there, we'd send cruise missiles, right? Yeah. So that means we go there so we won't kill everybody which means that we're in hand-to-hand -hand combat every time we do anything. It's a natural part of it. You, you grab more people than you shoot. So hand-to-hand -hand combat training, as far as how often it happens, happens vastly more than marksmanship. So super common. Okay. You know, when you're in, a, when you're in an 8 by 8 room, it's not going to come down to who, who understands sight alignment, sight, you know, trigger control, et cetera. It's not a marksmanship challenge, right? That's not what's going on there. It's a fight. And the one who's going to win is the one who dominates the fight, physically dominates, because you're not even going to get your weapon to bear unless you dominate the fight. So even weaponry, you know, like it's great to have a good sub one second draw stroke into an A-ring hit at seven meters. That's fantastic. <clears throat> so how much time from the time you recognize a threat to the point that person can cover eight meters because it might be less than that second. In fact, it probably is. Mm -hmm. and especially if you're in a confined space and that's what's changed in warfare, right? So what's changed in warfare is the world is more and more built up. And so we used to have battles out in the forest, right? If you go look at the combat stories of world war two and even Vietnam or whatnot, it's all stories out in the, out in the bush fighting in the jungle or the forest or, what not. Right. But that's not where we've that's not where we're fighting in, in places like Iraq, you know. In Iraq the fights were all inside buildings or between buildings or something. So you find yourself quite frequently in a very confined space with bad guys. So it's much, much more common to have hand to hand combat now than it has been probably in you know, several hundred years. And you're also wearing <clears throat> an extra sixty to hundred pounds, I guess, you know, with your Yeah, we're back wearing armor. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And that stuff has a, it has a, you know, it plays in the fight. You know, ma imagine this, right? A body armor with a, with a plate on the front. What if you're wearing that and somebody shoves you up against the wall and then lifts the bottom of that plate? It's going to choke you. <laughs> so, so your armor is a part of the fight and how you're wearing your kit. What if you, you know, Early in the war, we realized that U.S. soldiers were more likely to get stabbed with their own knives than they were to use them as weapons on the enemy. Wow. So, so, so why do you think that is, right? Well, I can tell you why. Who, who picks the knives that the U.S. soldiers wear to war? I'm it's guessing it's people who aren't, aren't the PX. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but, right? So 
it's not like some board said, oh, here's the perfect knife, because the knife we have is the bayonet, right? That's one they picked back in the Rambo era that's a big, clunky piece of steel that nobody even brings to war. So soldiers go down to the PX, see something that looks cool, buy it, because the PX agent thought they might think it would look cool and buy it. And then they put it on their kit in some random way they think it looks cool. And then they go to war. And then they don't think about that thing as a weapon any. They they you know only use it to like cut five fifty cord or you know paracord or or to open their MREs or to you know play mumble peg or something like that. And then they get in a fight, storm through the door, smash into the wall, fighting with a guy. It doesn't occur to them that they have this side arm on them. But the bad guy sees it, pulls it out and stabs him with it. Right? So you know, that's the nature of fighting. So, you know, that's why in basic training for several years now, we teach people, hey, your, your sidearm is your knife if you don't have a pistol. And so here's how you use it and when. Here's the tactic of when you would draw that. You know, and here's how you train for it so it'll be in your mind. Well, and, and Matt, we're uh, coming up on a, on the end here, but I want to ask you about blades. I mean, what, what blades or type of blade do you recommend? I guess that would maybe be for military but also for everyday carry you know for a civilian well here's what i would say so first thing i would say was folding blades present the challenge that you're going to have to employ the blade you know deploy the blade i mean in the middle of the fight because the fight is probably not going to start with your weapon in your hand right yeah most knife fighting training is baloney because the way because what are the odds you're on the battlefield and you've got you're down to just your knife and you have it in your hand and you run into somebody else's down to just their knife and they have it in their hand and you know, you see each other and then ha and then the music starts and it's, you know, West side story, right? Cause <clears throat> that shit ain't real. Mm -hmm. But what does happen is you get into a fight, either you or they have a knife. How do you know if they have one? Well, you don't. So you have to fight everybody as if they do. Cause you know, how do you find out your knife fight? Well, typically when you get stabbed, right? So you need to go into it knowing they might have a blade. And if you have a blade, you're going to have to employ it or deploy it from however you're carrying it while you're in the middle of a hand-to-hand -hand fight for your life. That's a challenge. You need to train for it. And if you're going to carry a folding weapon, you need to have a, you need to practice employing that weapon in the middle of a fight. So I would normally recommend fixed blade knives of various kinds because that's a much easier challenge then. But then I would also say this, the next important thing is um, so that the bad guy can't get it. You need to carry it in such a way that you end up with it in your hand because that's the critical thing. You know, if you get the blade into your hand and you grab the person with the other hand and you just play sewing machine with that blade, you will probably win the fight. If, on the other hand, they dominate you and get it in their hand, you're probably going to lose. So you need to, that portion, how you get it in your hand in the middle of the fight is the most important thing. And then, you know, so that you're able to employ it. And then the next thing I would say on that is think about what wins fights with blades. Well, stabbing people. So what kind of blade do you need? You need the kind that you can employ and the, and the kind that you that will work for stabbing the guy. And that's not as much, you know, it's not as simple as it sounds because the blade doesn't have anything to keep your hand from sliding up on it or whatnot. Yeah, you're stabbing right. the ribs, you're probably going to cut yourself, right? So, so I, you know, without getting too specific on, on it, which we can do later if you'd like, but, but you, you need to have a plan for your blade that's going to, and you need to practice it with it. Does that, that make sense? Oh, yeah. So do you carry it with your, would you have it on your offhand? So if you're right-handed, it would be you would grab it with your left hand. No, I carry my I carry a couple of blades. I carry um, I carry one on my and when I'm in my full kit, right? So imagine there are different scenarios. That's a better way to answer that question, I guess. If I, if I'm in a full battle rattle, like it's over, I'm doing some sort of you know raid type mission. Then I'm wearing body armor, I got my belt on, all that. Then I carry a blade just behind my where my sidearm would be uh, because in close quarters battle, it's probably even better to pull your blade because they can't grab it. You don't have one more problem. You know, you grab your pistol. It's really common for somebody to grab it. Now you're grappling over who's controlling the pistol. That's a, a problem. Um, so I, I carry one back there. And so then, but I would say another answer to that. I, I also carry the sock P dagger. If you ever, if you've seen Greg Thompson's sock P dagger, it's uh 
pretty good piece of gear that slides behind your magazines on your body armor. So no, it doesn't look no. like a knife. So, yeah, it's a pretty good piece of gear. Slot it's, P? Uh, uh, SOC P, S-O-C-P. That's Special oh, Operations okay. Combatives Program. So my, it's an invention of my, my friend Greg Thompson, who's a really high-quality uh, combatives instructor. But he, anyway, the idea is it doesn't look like a knife, and you can grab it with either hand. And it's, if somebody grabs you, you can pull it out and then stick them with it, and they're more likely to let go, right? <laughs> so, and, and with that being said, what I would tell everybody about, you know, I said it's about fighting over weapons, right? So, so when should you be armed? Well, you should almost always be armed. So imagine I'm getting on a flight right now from here to, to London or Cairo or someplace. Can I be armed? Well, yes, because nobody's going to stop me from bringing a ballpoint pen on that plane, right? Mm -hmm. And if somebody grabs me and I'm just in my suit and I have a ballpoint pen inside my jacket and they grab me and I can get to it with one of my hands and stab them with it, they're more likely to let go. <laughs> so that's a good example of, you know, the situation dictates what I'm going to be able to get away with. You know, I wouldn't even buy one of those high speed, you know, s tactical pins or whatnot, because that's too obvious. You, you can go down and get a, almost any store around a pin that's steel that perfectly functional to stab somebody with. Make sure it fits in your hand. It's not going to hurt you when you try to stab them, you know? So, See, this so, is, so this I guess, you know, stuff. I try to stay away from specific advice, but that's, that's a, just a good example of evaluate your tactical situation. What about blade length, especially the uh, civilians? Well, even military. So I, I, I uh, designed a knife a while back, and it came out with a 7-inch blade uh, because it was, well, there's many reasons, but because of the process of getting a knife actually built by a major company. And uh, I would tell you that almost nobody ended up bringing it to war, even though it was a fantastic knife, but because it's too big, right? So, so typically about a five inch knife, I think is manageable on your kit. And that's a, that's a key thing, you know, and it can even be smaller than that. Because like I said, it's not necessarily to kill them with, right? It might just be to make them let go of you so you can get to your other weapon or something. But uh, yeah, not, not bigger. It's not necessarily better. Really, it's about how you're going to carry it. So if your, if your tactical situation is I'm in a, full kit on the battlefield or I'm going to a convention and I'm going to be wearing a, a polo shirt or, or, a, or a suit jacket or something that's going to dictate a lot of what you are going to wear. Also the local laws, you know, you know there's a reason why um, intelligence agents don't carry sidearms most of the time. Well, they don't because they actually make your situation more precarious in most circumstances. If I'm someplace where it's illegal to have a handgun, why would I have a handgun? Yeah, I'm way more likely to get wrapped up by the cops, right? So it's foolish. If I'm the same thing, if I'm in some, if I'm trying to be a sneaky guy and I'm in some foreign country and if I get busted with a handgun, <clears throat> it's going to be bad for me. Well, the, the, I got to weigh the odds of whether that's a smart thing to do. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. See that I could, I could go on and on on this topic and picking your brain, but for the. And, Due to time, I guess I'll move on because I want to. I would like to, if you have just a couple more minutes, Matt. Sure. Well, speaking of, since a lot of my listeners are civilians, some are connected mm -hmm. to the military, and some are not even at all. Uh, so, what what would you recommend? And this may be a tough question to ask or to answer you know, without a lot of detail. But I mean, what, what do you recommend for people to to know so they can protect themselves? Well, that's a big. That's a big. Um question but let me sort of answer by saying what are this what is the skill set of the person that I want with me when the chips are down so we have a we have a belt system in the in our uh, combatives <clears throat> and basically imagine what a belt system means in martial arts it really mostly means that somebody has the opinion you should wear it right so that's why you have six-year-olds getting taekwondo black belts all over the country those teachers just have a low opinion of what it means but what it means to me and the Cabaz guys, my students and whatnot, is it means you're the guy I want with me whenever we go down range. So what's the skill set you want from that person? It's the ones the situation is going to demand, right? So hand-to-hand -hand combat within reason is one of those skill sets. I need somebody who can handle the situation in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or an MMA fighter or something. Imagine there's two, there's two basic scenarios of fights in the world. 
The first one is help is on the way. So imagine I'm a, I'm a member of an elite counter-terror unit. We fly hundreds of miles behind enemy lines. We attack this house where there's, you know, bad guys in it and whatnot. Maybe we're going for a high value target or something. And I get in a hand-to-hand confrontation with somebody. What do I need to do to win? Well, the answer is I just need to not lose because I'm not in that building by myself and you're going to come help from one of my buddies, right? So I don't have to be Bruce Leroy, right? I just need to be able to make sure that I can handle this guy long enough for you to come help me. So that's help is on the way. And that's most of the time when you're the good guy, right? When you're the good guy, most of the time, you're in a confrontation with somebody in a mall or something. Odds are some other person is going to help you step in. You know, all you got to do is handle them long enough so they can gain their courage to come help you. So then the other scenario is help is not on the way. So now I'm, you know, whatnot. I'm in a bad part of town. Probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. I get in a confrontation with somebody. Maybe nobody's coming to my aid. What do I need to do? Now the standard of victory is get away. Right? So even if I drop the guy dead at my feet with the Kung Fu death grip, right, or shoot him because the, the death grip is real. It just involves pulling the trigger, right? So, so whenever I drop the guy dead at my feet, now what? I still need to get away because maybe he's not alone. Just because help isn't on the way for me doesn't mean it's not on the way for him, right? So what's the skill set I need there? I need to be a proficient enough at a grappling with people to be able to dominate them such that I can get away from them. That's not the same thing as submitted him and broke his arm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the same. If you, if you take that sort of approach across the board, what skill sets do I need? Well, need to be a good driver. You no first aid. you know, do I really want you with me if you don't know how to apply in a turn, a tourniquet? No, you know, you need to be able to land nav, because people who get lost get killed. You know, you need to be able to da, 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 da. You can go down the list of things like that that I would really like you to do. And those are the things that we measure in our combatives program. Our, I mean, in our belt system. Is that the person I want with me? You know, so right now there's only, I think, 13 or maybe 14 combatives black belts in the, in the world. And those guys are each one of them an epic badass, you know. They're all guys who've been in the wars and whatnot, but they're also all black belts in jiu-jitsu, you know, MMA fighters, most of them professionals. They're also very competitive at, at uh, you know, uh, marksmanship sort of competitions like uh, IDPA or IPSC or USPSA. PSA. They can all shoot a long gun proficiently at range. They, you know, they all have, you know, combat trauma training, et cetera, et cetera because they're the guys that I want to go with me. And there's steps along that way. You know, start today. Do you know anything about first aid? Well, the, the Red Cross gets first aid classes every place in the, in the world or every place in America. Go take the class. You're going to be better to have around if you have that. So but, but what I try to tell civilians is this. Remember that shooting that happened in Texas not too long ago, the church shooting? Yeah. And the guy across the, the, guy across the street right, was a, had been an NRA instructor, right? So he went in and grabbed his weapon and came back out, faced down the bad guy, put an end to the situation. That's the guy we need. You should go through life knowing that you're the warrior in the room. Everybody around you is safer because you're there. Because if things go down, you're going to help make the situation better. Right? Mm-hmm. You're fit. You can't be, a, can't be the person we need if you're not fit. So you, you do exercise, you know, PT, you eat right, you do marksmanship training, you've got first aid skills, you've got some hand-to-hand skills, you've got the skill set that the situation may demand. That's what you can do. And you can do that no matter where you're at. Our whole system is designed around the fact that you can go down wherever you're at. You're in South Dakota, you know, you're in, in Utah, you're in upstate Maine, wherever you happen to be you can find what there is available to you to make yourself more capable because it's available. It's there. Go, go find those things because we need you, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, what, what in closing would you like to say about your, your businesses or your, you know, anything about you? Well, what I, what I, my main job is I run the combatives training for the, for the military academy at West point. 
but what I do as a, as a sideline, just because of what we were just talking about is run training events around the country at, at, uh, both shooting organizations and martial arts organizations to come help fill in that skill set. You know, if you're, if you're a martial arts school owner, if you're a, a you know, sh- shoot at a range or train at some place or own a range or whatnot, we, me and my guys who are some of the toughest guys in the world who are, you know, who have the people who've been doing it the last 15 years, me and my guys will come out and we'll fill in those gaps in your skill set, whatever it happens to be. You know, you can get world-class level jujitsu or mixed martial arts or, or all that filtered through the lens of combatives, meaning people who've had live fights downrange and know what it's really all about, not supposition, or you can take marksmanship and put it to that level of how gunfights happen downrange, you know, and how they may happen on the street. So if you're interested in that, give us a holler and we can bring it wherever you want in the, and wherever you want in the world. We've trained people from, uh, all the way from from Oklahoma, where we have an upcoming event, uh, all the way to Kuwait, United Arab Emirates. You know, we've got the Japanese Army training on our system now. Imagine that. You know you're doing well in the martial arts world when the Japanese Army is starting to do your stuff. <laughs> well, thank you. This has been a blast. Yeah, really good. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs>